Greetings adventurers, and welcome back to Abnormal Voyages. My name is David, and today we find ourselves in Baraboo, Wisconsin. We are here at the International Clown Hall of Fame to learn all about the amazing art of clowning. Not to mention, learn a little bit about some of the funniest people to ever live. Tag along. I'm here now with Mr. Greg DeSanto. How are you doing today, sir? How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for allowing us to come in. Well, I'm thank, I'm thank you for thinking of us and coming through here <laughs> in Baraboo and seeing all these great circus uh, things here in Baraboo. Absolutely. The circus World Museum, the Al Ringling Theater, and the International Clown Hall of Fame. And it's such a unique place. Like, you wouldn't think that, you know, just here in the middle of Wisconsin, there's so much rich history. There, you, have to, you have to really try to get here. It's, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you ha it's a destination. There you go. So a lot of people come here from the Dells, the Wisconsin Dells, of okay. course, which are very big tourist areas. So that, we get a lot of feed from that. But if you're a circus buff or a circus enthusiast, this is the this is the mother load. This is like the crown jewel. This is, where this you is be. it. This is where you want to be. <laughs> well, let's just jump right in. What can you tell me about this awesome place? Well, the Clown Hall of Fame, and I'm going to assume you're not afraid of clowns. No, sir. There you go. <laughs> uh, was actually established in 1986 in Delavan, Wisconsin. So it wasn't always here. Okay. And Delavan, Wisconsin is a little town outside of Milwaukee. Uh, has a circus lineage similar to Baraboo. Uh, Baraboo, of course, holds the Ringling Brothers. They started the circus here. But uh, Delavan also had some circus lineage and it was actually a project. It wasn't really intended to become a museum. It was a project between the U University of Wisconsin Whitewater and the Delavan Chamber of Commerce. The the, the uh, business department at the UW Whitewater was tasked to create, the students were tasked to create a program or design something that would be a tourist attraction and do, okay. the, do the business end of it and say, we want to create businesses or a tourist event here in Delavan. What would you pick? And they said, well, the circus seems like it would be a best fit. And luckily they picked clowns, otherwise you would be doing this in the Lion Tamer Hall of Fame <laughs> would not be nearly as, as interesting, but uh, might have a bloodier ending. It could, it could, <laughs> and uh, so they actually put together a proposal, and it was a project. It was a school, college project, and then the chamber actually kind of went, you know, this could work, <laughs> and they said, why don't we try this? And they actually did. So in 1986, they uh, gathered, a, it's a 501c3, so they became a not-for-profit, okay. and they gathered some, some clowns and some interested parties, and they opened up a very small museum in Delavan, Wisconsin. It grew very quickly to a fairly large museum in Delavan, and it actually did exactly what they said it was going to do, which was increase tourism to Delavan. And after about 15 years in Delavan, they were lured to the big city of Milwaukee because <laughs> they figured, well, oh, you're, you're a big thing here. Go to Milwaukee. There's so many more people. Sure. But they found out when they went to Milwaukee, they were not only were there a lot more people, but there was a lot more competition. So they in Delavan, they were kind of the big fish in small pond. In Milwaukee, they were one of many things you could do. Tons of fish, yeah. Tons Grab of fish. Your attention. Yes. <laughs> so they struggled there for a few years. Eventually, they lost their lease. They had to put all these artifacts that you're going to see here in storage. And, and that's where it sat for a while, for a couple of years. And it's very hard for a museum to raise funds when your museum's in storage. Nobody can go see it. Nobody like, can go this see is it. What I want to fund. So yeah. wh where is it? So uh, the board was kind of aging out a little bit and they, they called me and they knew I had been a professional clown. And I lived in Baraboo and I'd worked at Circus World for eight years. Okay. And so they said, uh, you're interested in the history. You've been to the museum many times in, in Delavan and in Milwaukee. And uh, we have two options. We're, you can, we're gonna either sell it on eBay, which would have been a terrible thing, or you can come and get it. And so, I guess I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, uh, my wife kicked me, 
it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we moved the museum. We didn't really know what was, because it was in storage units. So we had to actually ac access all the things. So we moved the 501c3, not for profit, re reactivated the board. Five trucks, very big trucks oh, full wow. of stuff, came down here in December of 2009. Okay. You never want to move in December in Wisconsin. Especially here. In Wisconsin. <laughs> the week between Christmas and New Year's. It just, oh. uh, but we moved all these boxes in here, and January 1st, I had my own personal Christmas because I got to open all these boxes and I was finding all these amazing artifacts that they had collected and were donated and were preserved. So we knew that there was a museum here. We just had to figure out how to display it. And so you had it all the pieces. We had all the pieces. Put it together. Right. And so with a lot of help, certainly not by myself, but with a lot of help, um, from January till May, we put up everything you see here and we opened in May of 2010 and we've been open ever since. Fantastic. So it's a it's a great, like I said, it's a great fit for Baraboo. Uh, we feel like, you know, in the circus wheel, there's spokes. Well, we're one of the spokes that, you know, people come here to, there's clowns and you go down there, the Circus World Museum, and there's live shows and elephants and animal acts and clowns in the theater, which is a magnificent thing. So it really is a, it, we all complement each other, I think. Yeah. So that's really important. So for tourism, that's been a, been a good thing. So, awesome. so that's how we got here. Okay. Now, this room is called the Art of Clowns. So it shows how clowns are depicted on things like posters. Uh, those are silk paintings. They're clown fake. These are actual all clowns, real clowns. They're not generic or hybrids or these are actually performers okay. and these are painted on silk they were done in Asia these are clown faces that are preserved on eggs they paint their clown face on a goose egg and it's a tradition that started in England after the war and there's an artist here in America who does it Linda McBride and uh, so it's kind of a way you can't really trademark your face or copy it but it is a way to sort of an honor amongst clowns, you wouldn't copy another clown's face. Gotcha. So it's kind of a way to preserve that. Okay. So that's kind of a cool... I like that uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. it I is... It took a long time to do that, a very soft touch. Very soft touch. <laughs> there's clown sculptures, there's clown paintings, there's stained glass. I mean, there's just, there's, like I said, some different sculptures. And this is a, a clown face that was on a carnival funhouse. Wow. So, uh, and originally, uh, the eyes and the mouth moved. There was a motor in there. Okay. But that's a little scary. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do any uh, restoration on this, or is this still the original painting? Uh, that is the original paint. It's so vibrant. Yeah. It looks yeah. great. It really, it came out pretty good, yeah. And then these are some, uh, you know, we said the art of clowns. These are clowns artists, Jim Howell and Dustin Portillo. They are not only amazing artists, they're actually performing clowns. So this was like a side thing that they did. Actually, Jim is very well known for his clown art. And these are some of his original, uh, some of them original paintings. These are the first inductees into the Clown Hall of Fame. It's Otto Griebling. Uh, and Jim was in the very first clown college class, which was run by Ringling from 1968 to 1997. And then this gentleman, Dustin Portillo, he's a much younger clown, but these are some clown, uh, ringling clowns from the, I guess the 80s and 90s mostly. Okay. So these are, uh, again, some of his original, uh, their pencil and uh, pen. I see like some of the colors, it's definitely very 90s feel. Very much. <laughs> some of those costumes. We're not subtle, we're never subtle. <laughs> and that's me as a clown. That's what I look like as a clown. Really? Yeah. I like it. So there. And then uh, we also honor uh, not just clowns in the circus, but we also honor clowns that are in movies. So like Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. Uh, people say, well, how can they be clowns? They don't wear red noses and big shoes. It's like, that's not what makes a clown. That's, you know, an element of it, certainly in the circus. It's not really what defines a clown. It's more of a personality and a character type in the slapstick, the physical comedy. So I would definitely put these, at least these three, you know, Laurel and Hardy, Chaplin and Keaton, as definite clown influences on, uh, you know, when I was growing up, Dick Van Dyke, Lucille Ball, uh, Carol Burnett, Abbott and Costello, Jackie Gleason. They oh, were all kind of physical comedy. Physical comedy. Classic, they're they're very much cla Three Stooges. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. So. Is that Buster Keaton's actual hat? Is that, that is Buster Keaton's actual hat. Wow. Yeah, and that's just one of his life casts. So that's his face. That's incredible. 
And Mark Anthony was a tramp clown. And in addition to being a wonderful clown, he was a sculptor. He was kind of a hobby. And he would take basswood, almost like balsa wood, and hand carve these little clown figurines and then <laughs> color them. And there we have his entire collection. This is just, a, there's about 400 of them total. But this is just a small sampling of them. great. Yeah. So this was like a little side thing that he did. And then eventually when he retired, this became kind of like a supplemental income, I guess. You know, he just did it as, a, as fun. And, but clowns would commission him to like do their own. I don't know if you can guess who this person is here. If uh, uh, well, don't look at I, that. I, oh. <laughs> don't look at well, that. See, I looked at it, so okay. I, I don't want to fairly guess, but it looks great. That is, it, uh, it Mr. is Dom DeLuise. Dom DeLuise. <laughs> that is Dom DeLuise, who's not necessarily a, a traditional circus clown, but again, physical performer, was on a lot of shows. He did play a clown in a film called uh, Happy the Clown. Okay. which is what this is from and uh, this is the original painting and it was uh, given it was given the artist who painted it uh, was quadriplegic oh wow so he painted it holding the brush in his mouth so that's pretty that's amazing i couldn't do that with both my hands and everything. exactly <laughs> and then the artist presented the painting to dom de Louise, and then before dom passed away he gave it to the clown hall of fame to be showcased here wow, so he, he was nice. it was very generous of him yeah that is outstanding. So come on in. It's a test. It's a test. I would think well into the hundreds. That's a very good guess. It's a little high. Okay. Uh, 50 clowns. A very good guess also, but a little lower. A little... 35. You're getting warmer, but oh. a little lower. <laughs> all right, all right, let's... You know what? My favorite number's always been five, so I'm going to go with those five. You are so close. Four? You know, there was a big sign right there, and I... So there's, I, I guess it's three. That's what I'm... That, you got it! Look at that! <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are three types of clowns, and these are the types, the white face, the Auguste, and the character. All clowns in the world, whether they're in circus, or on television, or in film, or in vaudeville, they're all based on one of these three types. So, wow. yeah. So, so these are kind of the basic building blocks of every single clown you've ever seen. Every clown, you can you can figure it all out wow. just from these. So the white face clown, again, we use circus to illustrate it because it's the most colorful. Uh, but the white face clown tends to, you know, obviously have a white face. Uh, but really, the, what's distinguishing about them is that they are the straight man or the 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 authority figure okay. in the clown routines. They set up the jokes. The Auguste clown is a little more of like a slapstick, physical, dumb kind of clown. Uh, they have makeup like white around their mouth and eyes, but not like a full white face. They're a little more slapstick oriented. And these two generally work together. Okay, so it's kind so, of the straight man and that's kind of like the brunt of the joke sometimes? Like Abbott and Costello. Gotcha. Ricky, Lucy, <laughs> Bert and Ernie. <laughs> you I know, love it. You know, you kind of can, you see it all through them all. These two came out of Europe. The character clown is the only one that actually originated here in the United States. And that came out of the Great Depression. There was a lot of men out of work in the, after the stock market crashed, so they had nowhere to go. They became hobos. A lot of them rode the rails. They jumped on freight trains and traveled. So their clothes were a little more tattered, a little dirtier. They tended to grow a beard because they didn't shave every day. They had a lot of soot in the tray in the yard. So before they would eat, they would always wipe their mouth and what they would do that is take some of the soot away from their mouth. So this part of their mouth was always lighter in color. <laughs> so that's why you see a lot of them have the, the kind of the white it's all around. the soot and then the white. The white. And yeah, same with their eyes. Good. They would wipe the soot out of their eyes so they were a little lighter there. They like to drink a little bit so their nose used to be oh, red. So, but, and like a, a character clown would be kind of like, a, like an Emmett Kelly or a Red Skelton. Okay. You know, things like that. But occasionally they do all work together and, you know, it would be, you know, this would be the Three Stooges. This would be Mo, that'd be Larry, and that'd be Curly. A good combination. A good combination. So. The oh. clown car. And they always ask, how did they do it? And we had a portable hole. We used to take it with us. And we, used to, we actually used to tell people that. And <laughs> they would look at, they'd be about five minutes into it and going, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Whole, whole part. part. <laughs> Where do you get one of them? I said, yeah, okay. Well, I got you. You know, we've had your time, and you're in the top five. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's a. It was actually a routine that uh, developed from a college 
fraternity prank. Okay. Uh, a clown around 1938 went to a college football game, not as a clown, just as a civilian, and watched the game, and there was a fraternity brotherhood there uh, pledging. And one of their pledge stunts was to take as many of the brothers and shove them in a vehicle, drive it out on the feet during the halftime. They all opened the door and they all tumbled out and the, and the place cracked up and laughed. <laughs> and the clown went, it's a good idea. And so he took the idea back to the circus. They got a car. The trick is, they take everything out of it. So there's nothing in it except a seat, the uh, a milk crate for the driver to sit on. So they take all the seats out, all the way to the trunk. So now I've told you the secret. <laughs> but, uh, the invisible hole, the portable hole, much more. <laughs> but, uh, and they were able to get 21 clowns in the car. That's crazy. And uh, it's kind of a, um, a rite of passage, I want to say maybe, if you join the circus and you are in Clown Alley, which is the, the, uh, the group of clowns, you want to be able to say at some point in your career you did the car gag. And so uh, it's a routine where seniority does pay off. Because <laughs> if you're a new clown, you get to go in first. Oh, so that's Which, that one. You're over. There? You're over here, <laughs> and if you've been here a while, you're you're in more little luxury over here. <laughs> and pretty much everything you can imagine that would happen in a car with 21 people does. <laughs> I leave it at that. We actually did an article for Car and Driver magazine on the physics of clown cars, and I don't know the first thing about physics, but I sure know about clown cars. And I gave the guy all the information, and he figured out the uh, ratio, body, <laughs> the thing. He and put the, some serious math in he did. Best. He did serious math, but I loved his illustration because he did draw one of the clowns dressed like a skunk eating a can of beans. <laughs> clown car, which is a very big car with a lot of clowns in it, is a very small car. Sure. Where only one clown comes out. And this is the car. Uh, so this belonged to a clown, Chester Bobo Barnett. Um, he built the car in himself in 1949. Wow. He used it until he retired in 1973. Um, it, is, uh, it was way ahead of his time. It's an electrically, it's an electric car. It's a clown Prius. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the size of a Prius. So. It's, it could be. It gets good mileage. <laughs> um, but he did a comedy dog act, and he was a tramp clown. Mm -hmm started out as a white face clown but then eventually went into the tramp clowns and uh he made his entrance in this vehicle so he came out now bobo this is his actual costume bobo was six two wow he weighed about 230. big guy and he was in this car with six dogs a skunk a suitcase and a trumpet i don't even know how that happened so. wow that's crazy. Um, he was a really well, uh, he worked a lot on, uh, on all the big circuses. He did a lot of shrine circuses for the shrine organization. And it was like a legendary act. And uh, his daughter had this car uh, in her garage for many years, covered up. And you know, she's like, well, nobody sees it here. So she donated it to the, to the Clown Museum. And That's we've had it on display. It was very generous. So, um, and Bobo performed this act uh, at least twice on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was a very big variety show back in the day. And we have film of him actually doing it here on the show, so you can actually see what uh, him and the dogs and everything coming out. So. <laughs> I bet people love seeing this. Yes, we've had a lot of people try to want to get in it. It's it's the getting out part it's the, <laughs> that, that, that worries me. You can shove them in, but then after that... The, I, I, you know, we got that big can opener over here. So, um, This gentleman... Um, I don't, I, I don't know what your age would be, but... Uh, some I know Red Skelton. Okay. Well, now, see, we get a lot of young uh, school kids type sure. things, and they don't know who Red Skelton is, which is a shame because he was a wonderful clown. Oh, yeah. uh, most generations remember him when like, you were in your 40s, 50s, and 60s or older. They definitely I, remember. I had parents who were fans of him and stuff and showed me some I, of the I was going to say. So, yeah. But Red Skelton was in our very first group of inductees. He was a, you know, primarily known as a, a TV clown. Right. But he had done movies. He actually started as a circus clown. His father was a circus clown on the Hagenbach Wallace Circus. And eventually then Red, when he was about 16, he joined that 
circus for a brief time, then eventually went into burlesque and vaudeville, and then radio and movies, and then. I didn't know that, but it makes perfect sense. It definitely it seems did. like it the did. perfect background for what he ended up doing. For what he did, it was it was it was the it was the thing. And Red, you know, create all these characters: uh, Clement Cadiedelhopper and uh, Sheriff Deadeye and Willie Lump Lump and uh, Freddie the Freeloader was probably the most famous, and that was done as a tribute to his dad. So it was kind of a makeup similar to what his dad had worn. So, That's cool. So yeah. And like I said, Red was in the very first group. Uh, so all these artifacts that are here actually came from Red Skelton himself. Man. And when he left television in 1970, uh, he, he'd always done painting, but he really took up painting after that. And uh, the only thing he painted were clowns. So these are all, some of it, not all of them, obviously there's thousands of them, but these are some examples of his clown paintings. That's incredible, some original Red Skelton painting. I don't know if you can recognize who that is behind the red nose. I do not, who is that? Well, it kind of looks like Lucille Wall. The other redhead. Oh, I'm so, I'm at a miss, what is it? Okay, you can add, you can dub it in later. It's Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett. No, it's what I, I wear my shame. I should That's know all that. right. We'll dub you. We'll cut it in. We'll, 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 we'll I'll just be like, is that do it in Carol Burnett? Do it in post. <laughs> Carol Burnett. Just, just move your mouth and I'll say it behind you. Carol Burnett. So, yeah. These look fantastic, though. He had some, I mean, we already knew he was talented, but, like, this just blows me away. Though that tiger's face is a little, a little off, but... <laughs> well, it's artistic license, you know. He was really good with clowns, not so much with the He animal. did great with the clowns. That the was clowns, the subject. So. That, was his, that was his preferred <laughs> subject. And this gentleman is Poodles Hannaford. Poodles was an equestrian clown, worked primarily on horseback. His family had a, a writing act. He did the comedy in it. Um, worked on all the big shows, including Ringling Brothers. That is the oldest costume in our collection. That's from 1917. I feel like shooting my glass almost or something. Well, we dust it pretty regular. <laughs> Not too much. I think the dust is what's holding it together. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, he, again, he's a wonderful clown. Wonder, and he, the, the name Hannaford is still active in the circus world. They wow. still uh, have circuses out there. In fact, uh, every year at Circus World Museum, the tent they perform in is provided by the Hannaford Circus family. That's so really it's, nice. still, it's still a very active family. And this gentleman, a lot of people don't know his name, but they know his face. I've definitely seen that face. The face is of Lou Jacobs. And Lou was a master clown, um, worked on the Ringling Brothers Circus for 65 years. Wow. Can you imagine working anywhere for 65 years? And uh, he joined in 1924. He was actually signed by one of the Ringling Brothers. John Ringling actually signed That's him. That's incredible. And uh, he was still working when I joined the show. So uh, we got to, he was one of my master teachers. I bet he had so much to tell you. Uh, it was kind of like worshiping at a shrine. <laughs> yeah, it really was. It that, was this is literally like learning at the feet of the master. You know, it was. You know, we did. We actually used to sit around him and just throw questions at him, and oh. and he would just talk for hours. I bet he had some incredible stories. He did. He really did. And uh, he's the very first person to ever have his face on a postage stamp while he was still alive. Wow. You normally have to be deceased about 10 years before the post office would honor you, but he was actually on it while he was still alive. And I see they're stamped in Sarasota. Yep. Very nice. And these are some of his clown shoes. These came from about, these are about dated 1938. And he signed them to us. Wow. He's got a really nice signature too. He you does. can actually read what it says. Yeah. I've seen some that people just like the <laughs> Oh, the celebrities nowadays. <laughs> can't can't win. And this gentleman, a lot of people do know this man's name, uh, Emmett Kelly. Uh, a lot of people, it, it, he's kind of like the the circus clown. If you name, you know, obviously there are a few others, which we talked about a little bit. Bozo the clown and Ronald McDonald. Those are actually to go back, there's four types of clowns. There's the white face, the August, and the character. Then there's those, and they're, they're called the rich clowns. <laughs> Very few of us. <laughs> I, I want to be one of those ones. <laughs> we all do. But no, those are more franchise type, uh, corporate mascots or uh, licensed kind of things. So gotcha. they're, they're a little different. So, I mean, I joke about it, but they are, they're, technically, they're white face clowns. It's still part of the. Uh, the art oh, absolutely. And, they're, and you know, they are inductees here, too. Because most people, if you were a kid growing up, you might saw Bozo if you're a little older. 
older, you know, you, you would remember him as a kid. And uh, I think we've all probably donated to the Ronald McDonald of course. Uh, fund. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> More than one filet of fish. So, but Emmett was a, a tramp clown, wonderful clown. Uh, really became famous renowned after he left the circus. He was very well known on the circus, but he was one of the few that, after 1956, he left and then went and did uh, shows in Las Vegas and Reno. Oh, it was the opening act for Red Skelton. Wow. Uh, did Carol Burnett's show with Jackson 5. I mean, he, he did a lot of other things other than the circus. He was also very smart as a businessman. Again, clowns are not known for that. Uh, <laughs> he merchandised and kind of marketed himself. So a lot of these things came out in the 50s. Uh, dolls and puzzles and banks and games and uh, decanter. You could actually take his head off and have a shot of whiskey there uh, if you so wanted it. But uh, he advertised for Coca-Cola. Um, this is definitely the the one that comes to mind when I think a hobo clown. Just most like people, this. yeah, most very people. Very much this is thing. very iconic. Yes. He was smart enough to convince a toy company in 1965 to create a ventriloquist puppet of his clown character. His clown character didn't talk. So it was really easy to use. That you puppet could be the worst, right? the world's best ventriloquist <laughs> with that. I felt like I saw him live. Uh, you know, it's right <laughs> after Marcel Marceau's greatest hits, right there. <laughs> and our clown shoes are oh, lots of shoes. Lots of shoes. Um, they are pretty iconic in that they're made of a mold of your foot, so they only fit you. Okay. So it makes them the, the, probably the most comfortable shoe you'll ever wear. They also make it the most expensive shoe you'll ever wear because they're only made for you. So yeah, they're all custom tailored. They're all wow. custom tailored. So and in the inside is they put horsehair, which is what gives it the shape, and then they're this is where your foot goes. And the cobblers can make them in any shape, size, form. You can see they put roller skates on them, checkers. Uh, they even have chicken feet <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you so desire. <laughs> And who doesn't desire, right? Who doesn't desire? <laughs> these, which are not the most spectacular looking pair of clown shoes, these are Ronald McDonald's very first pair of clown shoes. Wow. So if you've you've probably helped buy these with a with a Big Mac or two. <laughs> there you go. But these are his very first pair of shoes. That's incredible that you have those here. Yeah. That's awesome. And then what are all these uh, signatures? It says these were the clown shoes the by the last clown alleys of the Ringling Brothers and Barn Belly Circus when the show closed in, 19, in 2017. So oh, there's man. two units, the red and the blue. Because it was two different shows going at one right. time, right? Going okay. back and forth. So the clowns on the blue show, of course, signed the blue shoe. And so this was the last actual clowns that toured with the Ringling Brothers Circus in 2017. So these are all their signatures. And then I got, we got them on this shoe. This is the red unit. They signed that shoe. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, I hope that that's not going to be forever the last one. Well, let's hope. I, I, I would love to, to keep adapting. To, I would love to update that someday and put a new, and hopefully we'll get some more. Fingers crossed. Let's do that. <laughs> These are all pretty much people that have been inducted into the Clown Hall of Fame. So since 1989, we've inducted 77 people okay. into the Clown Hall of Fame. Uh, the criteria is you have to be a performing clown for at least 20 years, and you have to have recognition um, of course, with general audiences, as well as within your peers amongst the professional world of clowns. Uh, and that could be national or international. So we have inducted many clowns from Europe, and not just circus clowns. There's clowns from rodeos, clowns that worked on ice capades, movie clowns, Charlie Chaplin, um, uh, female clowns. I mean, there's, it's, there's a, it's a quite a wide uh, variety of clowns. So anybody that can fit into any kind of discounts as clowning, is could, somebody that could be eligible. Potentially to be get in, yeah. So we generally do inductions once a year, sometimes every two years. COVID kind of slowed things up a little bit, but we're hoping to get back this year with some more inductions by the, the end of the summer. So. Now, besides that, is it a board, I suppose? It's a, there's a committee, a nominating committee. We take, you know, people submit names uh, and, you know, why they think they should be, people should be inducted, and then we just look at them. And a lot of times we kind of prioritize them, like, this person still alive. That's because it's always nice to give the actual person the award, of as course, opposed to their widow there. or their cousin or grandkid or so. You know, obviously some of them have passed, but uh, we do tend to look at the, the, the clowns that are still with us and then go down like the line. Like who could we maybe honor that it's still around? And yeah, yeah, that's it. Would be nice for that. Thanks for yeah, these are all their clown props. They're uh, 
you know, every day trunks. We all lived in these kind of trunks. Um, and everything we owned, as far as clown wise, was in these things. They got loaded into wagons. The wagons got loaded on the train. The train traveled to the next town, and there we are. And this gentleman, Frosty Little, he was um, uh, became a clown in 1968 on the Ringling Brothers and Barnabilly Circus. He was went to the very first clown college class. They didn't even call it Clown College. They called it the College of Clowns back then. And this was started on the Ringling Circus when the, the show was finally sold out of the Ringling family to Irvin Feld. Irvin Feld bought the circus. He had been promoting it for many years, but he bought the circus in 1967 and he wanted to expand it, make two units. So he went to see what he bought and he went into Clown Alley, which is our dressing room. And there were 14 clowns, many of them that are in here. And uh, the, uh, the youngest clown was 53. Oh, wow. The oldest clown was 88. And he's like, they're great clowns, but they can fall down. I don't think they can get up. <laughs> so, and it's gonna die off. This, this profession will die off. So he said, let's start a program, a train where these older clowns can pass on, you know, like as a master apprentice type Can't of thing. Keep the art alive. Kept to keep, uh, keep the art alive. So he uh, founded this College of Clowns in 1968. Frosty was in that very first class um, and then traveled with the show. Eventually became a master clown with Ringling and was there for about 23 years on the Ringling Circus. Yeah. And, but the Clown College really kind of salvaged, it was the salvation of clowning in America. Because, like I said, there was not a whole lot of other, you know, there, there were a lot of circuses, but the clown contingent was getting much older. There wasn't a lot of youth coming in. So between 1968 and 1997, they graduated 1,275 graduates. That's incredible. Yeah, of which I am one. I went to the clown college. My parents are so proud. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they hoped for. You were born and they're like, let's just hope someday. You, yes, <laughs> they have no idea I'm doing this right now. That's a, so no. What is it that makes somebody a master clown? I've heard you say that a couple of times. Is that um, I think it's, again, it's just that you reach a level of proficiency in your craft. You teach, you know, you're, you're a teacher. Uh, you create material, you generate material. Um, you, you know, I, the Master Clown title, especially on Ringling, it was only given to about four clowns. Uh, Bobby Kay, Lou Jacobs, Otto Griebling, and Frosty Little. Many of the other clowns here are deserving of it. It was, but it was a Ringling oriented. Kind of their tradition. Kind their of tradition. But okay. I, most of these clowns in here, I would, I would consider Master Clowns. Because they just reached the pinnacle of their profession. Absolutely. I mean, once yeah. you, there's nowhere to go from there. You're like, nope. you, you've done it. That's it. <laughs> so. so what happened in 97 that they shut it down? They were making more clowns than they could use. That makes sense. So Clown College was a difficult place to get into. Uh, you know, everyone thinks it's a joke and it's easy. Uh, we, it was like a six page application. Wow. And it was kind of a psychology test. They wanted to know not just, you know, why do you want to be a clown? Uh, when was the last time you cried? Uh, and why? And do you get along with kids? That's a good question. Do you like, are you allergic to animals? Um, do you get along with foreigners? Are you claustrophobic? <laughs> Things like that which don't seem like they're, they're kind of odd questions, but you go, oh, if you get on the circus, you're going to realize why they asked every one of those questions. So um, on the average, about 3,000 people applied a year. Out of the 3,000, they took 50. Wow. So the cut right there was huge. The 50 of us went to clown college which was 10 weeks long. So it was like a boot camp for the circus. Everything, it was kind of like you were, they were teaching you the fundamentals, how to put on makeup, how to design a face, how to sew costumes, how to do acrobatics, how to juggle, how to walk stilts, how to throw pies, how to spit water on everybody, drop your pants. I mean, it was it's great electives, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it really was a 10 week audition. That you didn't, you realize it later, but you're like, they're watching you for the 10 weeks going, do you follow directions? Do you, do you listen? Do you work well with people? You know, cause you're going to become part of this thing, maybe of this big circus of which clowning is a part of not, it's not about, you know, there's so many elements of a circus, like right. it's a mosaic and you're one part of it. So um, at the end of the 10 weeks, we put on a show for the producer of the circus, Irvin and his son, Kenneth Feld. And out of the 50, they picked how many people they wanted out of that group to go on the circus. They offered you a contract. So, like I said, it was 3,000 people, 50 get in, and on the average, a half maybe got jobs. So, 
Wow, so statistically, 3, all the way down to about 25. Statistically, they said it was easier to get into Harvard or Yale than it was to get into Clown College. Um, and Clown College was free. Oh, wow. Which is amazing. Yeah. But like the Army, they trained you. So if, you, <laughs> if, you, if they wanted you, you had because they gave you this education, you had to sign a contract as an apprentice clown for one year and travel with the circus. So myself, personally, at the age of 21, I, I ran away and joined the circus. And not many people get to say that. That is pretty cool. That was a really cool thing. And I was studying theater, I was doing acting in New York City. And that was kind of the road I was going on. And then I, this thing popped up and I'm like, ah, you know, you're 21, you can do anything. That's when you want to do it. That's the time, yeah. That is the time to run away and join a circus. And I moved on a circus train. And I lived on this train. Oh. And it was our little home. And it was not a very spacious place. Um, but it was our home. And it traveled with us. So on Sunday nights, we'd go to sleep at one town. On Monday morning, we'd wake up somewhere else. And we did that for 50 weeks a year. And I thought I was going to do it for one year and just go back to New York and do theater. And uh, 10 years later, I was still on the circus. <laughs> You're just like, I'll fulfill my obligation, get the year out. And yeah, well, I was like, well, I can learn a lot of things here. This is cool. And it travel for free. You know, I'm going to they paid you. You know, you had no expenses. I mean, you basically, you, you had to pay for your food. That's it. That's it. I mean, you live rent free. You live, you know, they, you worked a lot. I mean, you were, we did about 13 shows a week for 50 weeks a year. So we did about 500 shows a year, which again, when you're 21, that's, you can do that. <laughs> now, not so much, but um, really I look back and it was 500 opportunities to get in front of an audience. And that's where you learn how to be a clown because clown college sort of sets you up for it. But the, the real teachers are the audience. They're the ones who are gonna tell you if it works or not. So clown college kind of gave you the tools and was like, yeah. you're ready to give it a shot. Here's the hammer. Yeah. Don't, don't hold it here, hold it here. <laughs> you know, kind of a thing's like, here's how to use these tools. Now listen to them. And you know, people say, well, how do you know if it's working? It's like, did they laugh? If it's, if they laughed, it worked. And if it didn't, they didn't, this, you gotta tweak it. So. I mean, it was a lot of hard work, but I have to imagine it was a lot of fun too. It was great. I mean, I spent literally my entire twenties on the traveling, on the, traveling around the country. So I played all 48 states. Uh, living on the train, and uh, it was a great life. That sounds incredible. It was. It really was. It, I, 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 after performing aspect of it, the thing I missed the most was the train, because every car was like the clowns were in one car, the Chinese acrobats were in one car, the Romanians, the the Hunga So you could walk through and just tell by the smell of the food. It's like <laughs> What's Chinese Chinese car. Well, we're like this is like a buffet. We're walking down here going, I smell goulash. <laughs> you know, so it was great. And you got to work and learn about their cultures and you know, if you you know, if people had kids on the show or, or not even if you had kids, if you you know, you wanted to learn you were all looking at historical stuff. I mean, you, you don't read about the Alamo. We're gonna we're gonna play it. Go, go see it. You know, we're right it's there. Here. We're going to be in that town tomorrow. Let's right. Well, let's go see the Alamo. Let's go look at the Liberty Bell. Let's let's go surfing in California. Let's oh. let's go, you know, to Miami Beach and play Madison Square Garden. And it know? sounds like an excuse to go have adventures. It was. It was. A, it was a great adventure. It really was. For for 10 years, I did it. And again, uh, clown props, a lot of times they're big. They're a little oversized. Um, people ask that question. Did you ask that question? I did not. Oh, what, no, you, why are props oversized? Well, thank you for asking that question. It's because, and it kind of goes even back to the makeup. Um, you know, when the circus came to America in Philadelphia, the Ricketts Circus, uh, it was one ring. Clowns didn't wear a lot of makeup and they talked a lot. They were very verbal. They were political commentarists, mm. if that's a word. They did political commentary on things, you know, kind of like stand-up comedians do now. Um, so the circus was very successful. So they added another ring and another ring. It just got bigger. And as they got bigger, the audience got farther and farther away from the ring. They didn't have electronic amplification, so they resorted to pantomime or slapstick or physical humor. And so to be seen, they started exaggerating their makeups more. So they put on big, bolder makeup, so they looked like cartoons from a I distance. Mean, that makes sense, so they could be more visible. More visible. And their props, to be seen, if you're going to drive with a, ride a pencil in a routine, well, this you're going to see this. <laughs> you're not going to really see a little pencil. So, um, so most of the clown props are, you know, just like I said, a little oversized. I took this when I got my COVID vaccine. <laughs> it's amazing how fast they move you to the front of the line. <laughs> Seriously. I got a quiz for you. Now we're going to do a little quiz. This summer clown props are punish, so you can. Uh, looks like a football to well, me. Well, look at that. You're very good. <laughs> they don't get cocky because they get. 
Uh, you know, if I had to guess, I'm gonna go with Chainsaw. Chainsaw! You've been through the tour already. <laughs> oh, okay. I get a little trickier now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Holy fish, swish, mm, I don't know, uh, sponge fish? I, I, I'm stumped. What is this one? Holy mackerel. Oh, oh. I, just, so I didn't say they were good. You know what? <laughs> I, I actually feel better about myself that I didn't get that one. Uh, deadpan. Very good. <laughs> All right, last one. Oh, that's whole milk. Yeah, you get the tours from now on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and these are our. These are some of the. Uh, in, these are just clown college and murals. We had the fifty some odd year reunion here, so we had we oh, put I together. Think that was fun. It was. They came in two cars, and they were here. <laughs> and it was everything. <laughs> Yes, I, I always do that one. But uh, yeah, these are some of the, the, these were our trunks on the road and some of the clowns did have children. That's her, one of our clown's daughters. So that was her actual little clown trunk and she- That's super cute. Yeah. She's got her little costume and everything. Little clown there. shoes and everything. I bet a lot of kids that, that grew up in that just wanted to be a part of that world after being completely yeah. so involved. My daughter loved it. I mean, she grew up, uh, we had left Ringling, my wife and I. Uh, by the time we had her, but we did work at circus. We worked on the Big Apple Circus and other shows. So she would come with us, and she was always like our little prop hand, you know. And she would put on a black shirt and black pants, and she'd move her little props and stuff, and we'd give her an allowance. But she <laughs> loved it. She's like to this day, she goes, "I remember meeting all these families from different countries and learning little bits of their language and their culture and the kind of food that they were eating." She go to someone's house, they're going, "We ate this food. I don't know what it was." I'm like, it's, "That's good. That's you know." So she loved it. She really it became. She was very comfortable talking to adults at a very young age, you know. And uh, I feel like growing up around those kind of cultures and stuff, she probably was such a more sympathetic human being growing very up. Very much so. To just understand and yep. relate better to the world as a whole and not so... Uh, yeah, no, it was very, it was really cool. There's about three years into teen years, not so cool. <laughs> Everybody goes through that. It's we all go through that, but well, we went really through that. She goes, you're going to embarrass me. I said, you have no idea we can do this professionally. <laughs> you have no idea how embarrassing I can be. <laughs> So don't don't actually, test me. Don't test me. <laughs> so did you actually meet your wife while you were doing the yeah, circus? Yeah, on the circus. Yeah. Oh, that's so. great. So you have the circus to thank for. I do. I have a lot of. I, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It really was a. It was an amazing uh, opportunity that I'm glad I took at the time when I took it, and I wouldn't change anything because it would change everything. You know, it's like exactly. one of those things. Butterfly you go, effect. Right. So I'm like, no. Everything was where it was, and and I've done this for 37 years. So I've been doing this for 37 years. That's incredible. So I still perform, not as much. Uh, obviously, the museum is uh, generally tends to be a, a seasonal thing because of the weather in Wisconsin. Uh, but I the summers that. were very busy, and uh, and then the rest of the year I do a lot of teaching and I do tours, uh, short tours. Uh, now that my daughter's all grown and on her own, she doesn't she doesn't need us anymore. But I have her negotiate my contracts. <laughs> she's got to earn she's your agent, you know. She's my agent. Well, that was yeah. <laughs> She had to learn about that. She's like, <laughs> but these, and this is a, a European white face. So this is a little different than the, the white faces in America were a little more, not as uh, mime-like or this pirouette. This more removed. Yes. Than, those look like more kind of humanish, I guess. This one's very much a, like a very strict character. Okay. Kind of a, very, very severe, but their costumes are gorgeous. It's kind I mean, of and, like Mardi Gras colors. Yeah. Kind of situation. Yeah. And then clowning, you know, these are, it, it's all around the world. It's certainly not just in America. In fact, most of the clown uh, themes and routines actually originated in Europe. And you can see the, the trio, it's the white face, the Auguste, and the character. So, you know, you kind of see that through all of them, white face, Auguste, character. So I guess I should have asked this at the beginning. Where do we have the first clown? Where did it oh. you know? originate like the very first i think when the first caveman dropped a rock <laughs> on the other caveman's foot <laughs> and they all went Ooh. <laughs> that was the first cave there, wait, let's get him in here he's get in him class. in he's opening for us there you go <laughs> yeah i think it got, every country every culture has a clown i guess figure or you know like italy has commedia dell'arte England has jesters. Native Americans have what they call kachinas. Uh, Asia has Peking opera. So there's a clown figure in every culture. So I think, like you said, maybe it goes back to the caveman. So it just shows you how important laughter has always been. Oh, absolutely. Since the beginning. It's if you, we'd be we'd be dead without it. <laughs> <laughs>
Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> so that is our little tour. Well, thank you so much, sir. Uh, is there anything that you would like to uh, tell everybody at home? Please come and see us here at the International Clown Hall of Fame in Baraboo, Wisconsin. We're open from May 1st to Labor Day. We're open six days a week from 10 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. And uh, we're family friendly. And come on and see some of the greatest clowns on earth. <laughs> well, thank you again for your time thank today, you. sir. Thank I you. truly loved it. And uh, Adventure is back home. Thanks for clowning around with us. My name is David, and this has been Abnormal Voyages. We'll see you next time. <laughs>